Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where some makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me are... Uh, just me tonight, Joe. Welcome back, Joe. It's, it, it feels like it's been a while since we recorded. <laughs> it does. It's been like two weeks. Let's see. Uh, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking Hoptronics Double India Pale Ale tonight from New Holland Brewing. And uh, this will be a good episode because this beer is 9%. Oh, and, boy. Yeah, it's strong. It's tasty, though. It doesn't taste 9%. It tastes hoppy and bittery, though. Nice. I've got the uh, the Necron 99 from Three Floyds. It's an India Pale Ale. And it says, it's not normal. It's got a picture of a giant red robot wielding some kind of shotgun that looks like a sword. Sweet. Mine has space invaders on it, but all the invaders are hops. <laughs> kind of fun. That's awesome. <laughs> not going to lie. That's why I bought it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got some, uh, some really interesting news topics tonight that I'm excited to get into. Get into. First one being that open source VR headset that we've mentioned a couple times. They finally released all the CAD files for the entire headset. Yeah. It doesn't look like it includes any electronics. They're probably still working on that. I haven't joined the Discord forum yet. But all the CAD files are there, and they also have Fusion 360 uh, projects for them all. Um, the overall design looks pretty slick. Everything is 3D printable by design, and it looks like for assembly, everything snaps together which is awesome. Even the head strap, um, they want you to print out a TPU. Yeah, so. this looks like a really well thought out project, just looking through the GitHub. Now I kind of yeah. want to print one, even though I probably wouldn't do... <laughs> I'd probably never get the electronics and like make it work, but I also like really like projects like this that are very well thought out, and I'm like, I could make that. Sure. That could be right. fun. could be a fun weekend. Moving on in Maker World things and not just geek news, Lulzbot announced a new, very niche 3D printer this week. Uh, the Bio Printing uh, or Lulzbot Bio Printer. And uh, basically, what this looks like um, is a Lulzbot Mini that has been modified from an FDM extruder to a uh, liquid slash gel based extruder. And uh, they're partnering with a company called Fluid Form that prints out suspended hydrogels uh, as a way to do uh, matrices to build things with uh, stem cells. So it's it's really cool. I think it's super niche. Uh, but I also love that they are supporting this next level thing. Yeah. I don't know. I could totally get behind it. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I think it's really neat that we're seeing this super, you know, groundbreaking medical innovations being done with, you know, fully open source Libre yes. hardware. And I, and that's awesome. Well, like, I would have been a little bit sad if it was like MakerBot or, you know, Ultimaker, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's Lulzbot. It's all of our favorite open source hardware manufacturers. Well, I, I went to a university uh, a couple of years ago to see their additive manufacturing department and see the research that they were doing and all of the bioprinting and fluid based printing that they were doing. It was all on modified little spots, every single one of them. So this doesn't shock me that this is happening, but it is super exciting that as a company, they're now doing it and not just relying on their user base to modify their base machines. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome to get that manufacturer support. Yeah. I just like that it's white and blue. It is pretty. I would like that option on a normal Wolfsbot. Yeah, I know that there is a special edition mini that exists that is all Wolfsbot green with black screen printing. Ooh. I think there's one, maybe two in the world. And um, if you're listening and you ever get rid of that machine, you know who you are. Just just send it just send it to me. Just send it to me. Okay. <laughs> the next thing, do you want to take the next one? Sure. Uh Cohesion 3D, uh the company that brings you the best uh laser control boards. They just recently announced a firmware upgrade that um boosts the uh raster speed 
normal um normally when you're doing a, a grayscale engrave with with smoothieware you get kind of bottlenecked with how fast was it the usb can you get bottlenecked by the g-code interpreter and how much yeah. it can handle yeah this yeah. upgrade boosts it go ahead and take it joe you know more about this <laughs> than i do basically the interpreter um, can only handle about a thousand G codes per second in theory. It's more like seven to eight hundred in real life. And you don't ever see a problem with that when you're cutting because each line is a single code. But when you're trying to do anything like a grayscale engrave or, um, you know, a photo realistic engrave, you could have a thousand G codes and a quarter of an inch as that gradient is changing because every every time the gradient changes it's a new line of code so what the cohesion guys have done with their new firmware is um each line of code has uh six grayscale changes in it and um that allows you to have about one third of the amount of code that happens so we can go about three times as fast so average uh, raster speeds that we were able to handle uh with using smoothieware were about 75 to 90 millimeters per second and now uh, we've been seeing in tests up to 300 millimeters per second which is running on par with gerbil lpc and even the dsp based laser controllers Nice. Which is pretty awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, up until now, you know, they say, well, if you need to engrave faster, you know, flash the Gribble LPC, you yeah. know, firmware on it. But then you lose uh, the LCD control. Yeah, you, you lose, that. L- lose LCD and you lose SD card support. So there's, there's a couple things that you lose, um, which are annoying. But uh, this is pretty exciting. Um just a caveat for anyone who is using the cohesion boards with any software that's not Lightburn. Uh, at this moment, Lightburn is the only software that is supporting Smoothie Cluster, which is what they're calling it. Um, so I I don't know if we're going to see more software support this in the future. Um, I doubt we're going to see this in downstream Smoothie because you know, we haven't seen something as... You mean upstream smoothie or upstream smoothie? Yeah, you know, we yeah. Yeah, I was curious if this was a a custom thing that that Cohesion did, or if it was a, a Lightburn specific thing, or if it was Smoothieware and then we just adopted it. Uh, Cohesion wrote this stuff, but you know, seeing as we haven't seen simple things like soft limits show up in mainstream smoothie, right? <laughs> I don't. I don't well, know if we'll see this. I mean, in the spirit of open source, you, know, you can always just submit the PR and then you know, leave it to the maintainer. Yep. But also in the spirit of open source, Cohesion saw a problem and they solved it. And that's, that's pretty right. rad. That's exactly how it works. Yep. All right. Well, that's all we had for news. Joe, do you have any uh, project updates? Um, I built an axe throwing target this week. That was fun. Oh, neat. And uh, I'm learning how to slowly destroy my axes by learning how to sharpen them. So nice. What did you make the target out of? Um, it's a regulation world axe throwing league target. So it's uh, five two by tens wide that are four feet long. Uh, I left out the header and footer because I, I don't feel like I need them. And then I screwed it to the side of my kid's swing set. Like a good dad. Nice. <laughs> so that was fun. I haven't really got to dive into any other personal projects lately. Like my, I went from having not a lot to do to like, oh my God, I just needed a couple hours to sleep uh, in the last <laughs> couple of weeks. So uh, I'm just trying to catch up right now. How about you? I've been pretty busy myself, but mostly on project updates. Um, since the last product update, I was sick one day, so I stayed home from work. And I spent a whole eight hours going through KiCad tutorials. And I taught myself how to use KiCad, you know, so I could make the circuit board for the, the access control system. Sounds like a worthy um, way to spend a sick day. Yeah, you know, yeah, it was really nice. And, uh, you know, once you get through it, 
all the cons- all the issues that I had that I kind of spoke about on that one episode aren't really issues anymore. Like that was in an old version of KiCad. And so as I, as I went through it, you know, I installed the latest version and a lot of the issues I, you know, didn't even run into because I think it was, it was fixed on those. That's my favorite. But when like, yeah, you have a problem and then you go to the next version and you're just like, ah, yeah, that's rad. I wasn't the only one with that problem and they just took care of it for me. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I went through the contextual electronics uh, YouTube series called Getting to Blinky. And it was a, a tutorial on creating a circuit board that takes a, like a CR232 battery and blinks an LED with a 555 timer. Okay. Um, and so you have to, you know, make the, you make the uh, components and you make the schematic and then you assign the, the uh, schematic parts to an actual part. Then you take the actual part and you bring in the footprints and then you kind of lay them out on a circuit board and you kind of actually draw out the circuit board and place the parts. Then you make the traces based on your schematic. And it was really neat seeing how everything flowed, flowed together. It was about as obtuse as I thought it was. KiCad purposely breaks all those th- steps out, which they kind of cover in, in the in the t- contextual electronics tutorial. They said that some other EDAs, like Eagle, Eagle CAD and stuff, they lump some of those steps together. But then, like, when you make a part, they automatically assign a footprint, which is like the actual physical dimensions of the part, like the pads and stuff. Okay, yeah, yeah. Those, those get assigned to the part itself in the schematic. Whereas in KiCad, they're two separate entities. So you could set up, you know, let's say a, uh, know, an Atmel uh, microcontroller in the schematic. It has a certain number of pins or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then those pins get mapped out. But that's more of like an abstract representation of that microcontroller. And say down the road you swap it out for another Atmel controller that has the same pin layout, but a different physical footprint. You can then, you know, all you have to do is go into your, go into your design and change the relationship to the new footprint. Whereas in something like Eagle Cat or one of the other ones, you have to make a whole new part and then add, you know, the new footprint to it. Okay. Like they're tied together. So there's some neat things. I understand why KiCad does it now, but it is, it is a lot of, a lot of, uh, legwork and I still don't have the time for that legwork. So yeah. like I still haven't gotten my circuit board done in, in that yet. Yeah. Cause since I learned it, I haven't had much time to sit down and actually do it. Man, I've but, been there. I, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. So I did spend some time on that patcher site. Yeah, um, I mentioned that work? it in last week's episode. It didn't work well. <laughs> um, it's still super new. Okay, but I am I am very thrilled with the foundation they have currently. So if you haven't listened to last week's episode about the NomCon interviews, I, I talked with one of the guys from Patcher.io, which is P A T C H R.io. They're they're a web based mm-hmm. electronic schematic uh, web app. And it's all a Node.js app, and the foundation they have is really nice. Like, the UI is slick. Everything just flows really nicely. Currently, they only have, like, a set number of components to use. Um, they said that they're working on the fun- – they actually have in beta testing now the functionality to make your own parts or make your own components to import, which is kind of what I'm waiting on. Okay. They need some work on, you know, dimensioning your parts. So, like, I just wanted to make female pin header – you know, holes and then run traces from those, like just something simple. They didn't have anything like that. All they had was a single through hole component. So, so for my ESP32, you know, dev board, I, I try, I tried to make it work. I did one, I'm like, okay, I, I can probably, you know, make one, copy it, make two, copy the two, make four and kind mm-hmm. of scale that way. But it doesn't, you can't copy multiple components yet. Uh, and then their X, Y coordinate system, they have a zero, zero in the middle, you know, in the middle of your graph. Okay. So, you know, negative values would be to the left. Uh-huh. But the, their their coordinate system doesn't let you put in negative numbers, <laughs> which is more of a web app thing, a front end thing. So I'm like, well. This is something right. like my experience with fritzing when I needed to make a diagram and <laughs> couldn't add a 24 volt power supply. And I was just like, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I hit enough. I hit. I hit enough uh, roadblocks. Um, I was like, "Well, this isn't gonna work out." But you just drew I an send, Inkscape, I, didn't you? That's what I did. I just drew it in Inkscape. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, fuck! That's a great idea. <laughs> I was Damn joking. It. Uh, but you'll be good at Inkscape by the time you're done. I could. I could easily do that in Inkscape. There you oh, go. I could probably do it in Fusion though. Like, 
I could easily do it in Fusion now. I don't know why I didn't think of that, dude. Anyways. You could so, do board design Fusion. Yeah. Don't do don't try to treat Fusion like a 2D CAD program though. Every time somebody sends tries to send me a DXF that they made in Fusion, I'm just like, why huh. did you do that? Okay. It doesn't work well like that. Yeah, because all I want is simple traces and just a bunch of through holes. Yeah. Like just all through holes. I tell you to use DraftSite, but they're ending their free license this year, which just makes me mad and well, that's makes sad. me want to. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's going to be like $350 for the uh, the basic license a Yikes. year. And I'm like, nah, I'm, I'll find something else. Yeah. Um, I recommend you guys to take a look at Patcher, at least, you know, form it. Check, check it out, see what they have, let them know what issues you run into. I, I sent them like three different support requests for like the things I ran into. Yeah. Because the guys are really cool that I talked to. They're really chill. Uh, they're just like, it, it was really awesome talking to them at NomCon because they're like, yeah, you know, we we're all just, you know, some makers and some software engineers and we wanted to make a circuit board, but we didn't like all the options out there. Like none of them were easy enough. So, so the easy thing to do is to make our own. <laughs> This, this sounds very much like Pathio. And <laughs> and just like Pathio, you know, the best way to make a new software better and to make it work like you want it to is to be an early tester and provide loads of feedback. And yeah. just like, all right, this doesn't work for me. And here's all of the reasons why I'll come back on the next feature update and try it. And speaking of Pathio, I am... Um, uh, I actually do have two project updates that I completely forgot about. Um, oh, go for it. I'll circle back to the path, you because know, it leads into the other thing we were going to talk about. So one of them that I was actually really excited about last week is I got an opportunity to mill brass on my router. Ooh. And uh, I had never done that before. And it was super fun. Uh, I was making a press die for a rolling mill. So takes a negative of the image that you want to come out on the piece of metal and then you machine that into your piece of brass and then you roll it through this uh, rolling press mill and it crushes it into a piece of aluminum and uh, huh. so they, uh, the person that I did this for gave me a design and I spent a couple hours trying to figure out how to take that design and, and make it into something engravable and then I got to spend a good portion of my day figuring out how to engrave brass on my router. And uh, turns out it's not that hard. Cause it's pretty soft, isn't it? It's soft, but it's grabby. So it, it has a reputation for um, if you get too excited with it, it w the end mill will hook in and pull itself into the cut and break it that way versus uh. deflecting away from the cut, it'll pull itself through the cut and break it. And so when I was doing my engraving, I was using a uh, drill mill with a 90 degree point and an eighth inch shaft. So it's like a, you know, a pointed end mill that is made to drill, but also cut. And um, it did a really, really good job. I did end up using mist cool with it. And I got reminded that just because you freshly surface a MDF spoil board doesn't mean that that MDF spoil board will be flat. So I got to uh, make two parts <laughs> because when you're engraving a hump in your material, that's, you know, a half millimeter shows up a whole lot when you're V engraving. Um, but it was a really cool experience. And the other thing I got to make, um, was a jig for making jewelry and I won't go too much into it because uh, the person's going to sell these but um, it, it's a 3D printed part and uh, they basically gave me the opportunity to just design it however I felt I wanted and I spent a lot of time using the 3D printed uh, aspects of it to make it beautiful. So I'm kind of holding it up so Aaron can see it. Ha. Um, but 
I turned the infill into a feature instead of a yeah, portion of the part that's just kind of there because it's printed. So I printed it without a top and a bottom so that the infill was visible and so that it became an aesthetic feature of the part. And I, for this, I actually ended up modeling the infill. Uh, so it's very erratic and like has a really cool pattern to it. And the infill includes their branding. But I also spent a lot of time paying attention to how my uh, perimeter lines laid down and how uh, just how the whole part would come together because it was going to be very obvious that it was a 3D printed part. And um, one of the things that I had to take into account was I don't want to do any finishing on this. I want it to come right off the printer and be ready to hand off to the customer. So um, I don't know if you can see this in my webcam, Aaron, but kind of in the middle there, there's tons of stringing. And I was fighting this and fighting this and fighting this. And I was using Cura as my slicer. And I was printing this on my Lulzbot Taz with the arrow extruder head and a nozzle X. And I'm printing this in uh, filamentium PLA. So really high end material a very good uh, extruder with a very high end nozzle. And I was still just fighting this stringing so much. And uh, finally I got frustrated and I was like, you know, what's really good at perimeters Pathio. Yeah. So I downloaded the latest alpha of Pathio and I put in essentially the same parameters that I had in Kira got a pretty good idea and a pretty good uh, profile worked out for my Taz 6 with Pathio now, which is essentially the stock Taz 6 Pathio profile um, with some tweaks for material. And the first part that came off the printer was just absolutely gorgeous. There's no, nice. no strings. Uh, I had the best perimeters of any of the parts that I had tried so far. And um, the best outer wall finish it is just amazing. I I pulled it off and I immediately printed three more using the same code and they were all, it wasn't a fluke. It, they all came out like that <laughs> and handed them to the customer. And she was just blown away because the, the other parts that she had had made were, I would have thrown them away. Uh, <laughs> they, they looked way worse than the Kira parts that I've been trying to make that I wasn't happy with. So that kind of leads us into that article that we were going to talk about a little bit, which is um, complaining about 3D printing and cosplay makes you look like an insecure jerk. And yep, um, I just realized who wrote this article. <laughs> uh, it's written by uh, Caleb Kraft, who is a really incredible maker and up until recently was a writer for uh, make as well and does some really really awesome mechanical irises for like windows and stuff you should check out his stuff uh, but I completely agree with him for different reasons than he highlights in the article but I think if you are going to utilize a tool you should highlight the aspects of the tool and the thing that you're creating. And, you know, like we talked about in the past, use the right tool for the job, right? Right. But, you know, if you have an opportunity to design something from the ground up, design it for the process that you're going to use for manufacturing, design for manufacture, right? So that's what I really tried to tackle with this part was highlighting the process that was going to be used to make it. But um, I love this article because it one, the title made me chuckle, but it's so it's so right. Like. And I, I don't even do cosplay, but it, this is something that I deal with all the time with things that I make with laser cutters or 3D printers or um, CNC router or mills is, you know, somebody's like, well, you made that with a computer. Anybody can do that. 
I sculpted this with my hands. Yeah, you see this a lot in a lot of different industries, yeah. I should say. Because I've seen a lot in software development as well. You know, really? You get all these, well, I mean, you get all these gray beards who are like, ah, programs use too much memory, too much RAM, you know, these days. You know, we used to code an assembly and, you know, every every bit mattered. <laughs> yeah. And now you get these people complaining about Electron apps. And they're like, ah, they should just write write in a native language and, you know, not do not do an Electron app because it takes up too much RAM. and But it works well. But, you know. And it's beautiful. It works well. You get a fantastic interface, which, you know, there's not a whole lot of really great, you know, native uh, UI frameworks for, you know, native OSs. But if you can shoehorn in all of the awesome web frameworks into a native app, then, you know, you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Yeah. But same thing, you, you get people who are highly skilled and they've, you know, they've practiced and honed this skill over years and now something new comes along and democratizes the entire process. I, I mean, I, I, I understand, I empathize it with it. You know, they're, your, your skills become a little bit belittled because it's not, it's not just a, a super niche thing now. You know, you get more, peop- more people coming in who can you know, now just download something from Thingiverse and print it. Or now people are, you know, learning how to model themselves. And, you know, like uh, Amy Double D. Now she, she models her own cosplay yes. things now and, and prints them. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, trying trying to make some of those things out of foam or anything would take way too long. I mean, she did that uh, Vanellope Von Schweetz armor for, for uh, Murph. I mean, so all those gumdrops, all those licorice pieces, like, how the hell are you going to manually make all those? With gumdrops I mean, and licorice. But the thing was, like... <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess. Like, that armor was something special because she spent a lot of time picking out the materials that were specific to those parts and making sure that, like, that material would function well there. And it wasn't it wasn't all just, like, one PLA or whatever. Um, I don't think any of that armor was painted. I think all of that was... I, I think it was just straight printed. It was all just printed. And- natural filament color which you know that in itself being able to run a printer to make everything look that good and then spend the time to make the filament selections to make everything look beautiful at the end it, that's all a skill yeah yeah you know you could argue that cutting everything out of foam is less work than piecing out all these parts designing them all from scratch and, and cad yeah, she figured uh, out know. math algorithms to do the the licorice for fusion. Like yeah. that's yeah, like she utilized so many different other skills and technologies than just carving foam. Yeah. You know, and then like most of the things that I make, I designed the machines to make them. So like there's this extra As level do. on top of it that's kind of meta. <laughs> you know, and yeah, it in the end though, I think really what it comes down to is um, if you want to get something done, pick the tool that you're good at and get it done. And don't try to belittle people for utilizing their skills. Like, yeah. to, to take it a level further, I get frustrated when I see people buying a $200 Ender and making really, really amazing prints that I worked for years to get to. <laughs> or those of us who buy a $900 printer. And then now just three years later, people are buying a $200 printer and it prints about as good. Yeah. Or better in some cases. Yeah. I spent a little bit of time tweaking and things are gorgeous. Yeah. So I feel you, old graybeards. I get it. But at the same time, don't belittle people for trying to do awesome things. So I have two more project updates. This is just going to be a whole episode of project updates. A big tangent. I said I had a lot. All right. I'm fine with it. And then you just kind of commandeered it. tired. It's, it's been fine. a long week. No man. big deal. <laughs> so this weekend, I finally set up my own Nextcloud instance. Woohoo! To, oh, man. To make my I got to federate cloud. with you. Yeah, we man. I have so much stuff to do. I know. So this is this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time. If you listen to the show What version are all, you? You'll, 15. Okay. I think that's what I have. Yeah. Um, so I'm using, I'm using the official Nextcloud Snap package. And they're on 15. And they're waiting... For all the core apps to support everything in 16 before they upgrade to 16. Ooh, I wonder if I can upgrade to 16 right now. In in my endless quest for data privacy, 
I finally ha had a couple hours this weekend free that this is all triggered by uh, my wife's iPhone managed to completely disable itself and it, it required a complete wipe and reload. How, how did that happen? You know, she says that it was getting really slow and sluggish. So she rebooted it. And then on reboot, it was like, this iPhone is disabled. Please connect to iTunes. And mm -hmm. from, from my Googling, that only happens when you fail to enter the pin code 10 times over the course of an hour. So like after like, what, like two, five, seven attempts, there's an increasing cooldown to retry again. Okay. But after that cooldown in 10 times, then it's completely locked and it requires, it requires a wipe and reload. And that's a security feature. And, you know, props to Apple because I tried my damnedest to, <laughs> to try and get around it and like reset the password and all this stuff. And it, it is impossible. So, you know, kudos to Apple for that. But she was all upset because she's like, I don't know if, if my, all my photos are backed up because all of Freya's pictures from when she was born last year are all on oh, her phone. Man. I've been telling her for months to back up her stuff. Yeah. And she's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll get around to it. Yeah. You know. So after all that, I'm like, you know, once we get this settled, I'm going to figure out a backup solution for us for our phones and our laptops. So we don't have to run into the situation again. And, you know, I looked at Dropbox and I looked at some other stuff and, you know, I figured this would be the time to finally get that next cloud installation so I can, you know, get my own file sync. Then I can do my own calendar stuff, my own notes. We can do NextCloud Talk. Yeah. Seeing contacts, all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah. So what I settled on was it's a fully cloud-based solution. I'm using Amazon LightSail, which is kind of Amazon's um, DigitalOcean competitor. So they are um, virtual machines. Okay. Where you can, you know, do one click app install. So they have like WordPress and Discourse and all those things. So you can just like say, I want a WordPress VM and they'll install everything for that. Or you can just do straight, you know, distros. But they are, but even the lowest tier is even cheaper than DigitalOcean. So I am on a 512 megabyte, one CPU, 20 gig solid state drive for $350 a month. That's not $3.50. Real cheap. Then I looked around for, uh, I was originally going to do um, an S3 bucket for the actual storage because then that's kind of scalable and you kind of pay as you go. Um, I found a guide that hooked up NextCloud to an S3 bucket. But when I, you know, did some of the price calculators, it was going to, for like a, the same thousand, I, I was kind of shooting for like a thousand gigs as kind of like the baseline because like a lot like digit, like a Dropbox tier was 2000, was 2000 gigabytes or two terabytes for twelve dollars a month oh wow so if i couldn't make if i couldn't make this work that was going to be what i used was dropbox so that was kind of like my target to beat so i was going to use s3 but for a thousand even a thousand gigs is going to be like 30 bucks a month like for, for straight s3 storage so i looked around so um, google drive has 100 gigabytes for only like a dollar 99 and i'm like we could make that work yeah but next cloud um lost support for google drive officially when Google updated some security um, protocol stuff. Okay. So that that was kind of out of the question. I've been listening to the Security Now podcast for a while, uh, Steve Gibson's security podcast on Twit. And they've been advertising Wasabi, which is a new online cloud storage provider. And apparently they're doing some fancy calculations and some fancy stuff behind the scenes where instead of storing data in blocks on a hard drive, like traditionally you store data on blocks and sectors on a drive. Uh -huh. And based on if there's space or not for that, that particular file, they'll skip blocks or sectors. And Wasabi, they can actually store files sequentially on the drive. They can store bits sequentially. So then you can now jam pack way more bits in the same hmm. hard drive physical space. Okay, It's way beyond my comprehension. But they they've they've been they've been plugging that for a couple months. I'm like, oh well, I'll, I'll go check out what they have. I believe it's some sort of hybrid between S3 and uh, Amazon Glacier storage, where Glacier is like the long term, you rarely access it storage, right. so it's way cheaper. It's kind of in between there, but uh, for a thousand gigabytes, it, it's only around five dollars ninety nine cents a month. So 
I ended up and and the UI was really nice. They have a really nice you know web console, which I'm always a, a sucker for. Yep. So I ended up going with that. So now I, it's only costing me. It should only cost me about nine dollars a month for at least the first terabyte of cloud storage, and it's all web based, all cloud based. Um, Wasabi has what they call eleven nines of data reliability. Okay. So ninety nine point nine 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 percent reliability. Data redundancy. Okay. Seven, or I guess that was only seven. Eleven of those nines. <laughs> Add more nines. More nines. Okay. I'm excited for that. I, I I actually made a whole blog post on it, and I'll and I'll link that in the notes on my on my little portfolio blog. So why did you decide to go with somebody else's computers versus a a hard server sitting at your house? They you know where it's at. <sighs> and you know. This is a great question. It's going to segue right into what we wanted to talk about today. <laughs> So, because that's what I'm running, I and like I, I've yeah, debated I on going your route quite a few times, mostly because this I I know how old the server is and I know my drives and like at some point I'm gonna lose all this shit because I screwed up. And it's gonna happen. Yeah, <laughs> that that's that's pretty much it. So I've been running my own FreeNAS um, DIY FreeNAS box for about four or five years now, and you know that was about a thousand dollars to build that NAS. You know, between case, motherboard, drives, RAM, all that stuff. Yeah. I haven't done the math, but I'm not even sure if nine dollars a month will even have me breaking even yet on that. And now, now it's old. It's old hardware, right? And the drives will be going bad soon. And you know, those are about eighty dollars a piece now. I have three three terabyte drives in there. So, you know, it, it really came down to: is do I want? It's kind of it's kind of a two different related scenarios where it's do you want a, a project or a tool, you know, yeah. which we've talked about before, but also it, it's a, do I do I really care about having the hardware here and having to worry about it and you know if a drive goes bad, I have to I I am responsible on replacing the drive, ordering a new one and putting one in. You know, I be responsible for the infrastructure. You know, also have to worry about port forwarding or, you know, how do I actually access it from the outside network securely without, without, you know, interfering with the rest of my network or yeah. introducing more risk. Um, if, if my goal was under $10 a month for this, so if it was going to be more than 10, I probably would have just done it myself here locally. But, um, I think I have a really great solution picked out. And with this now, you know, Amazon handles all the infrastructure, all the hardware. You know, if there's any, if there's anything wrong with with the physical hardware, you know, they take care of it. Um, same with the storage. You know, with the with the Wasabi storage. You know, if there's a hard drive that goes bad, they're in charge of it. You know, their whole job is running that, so they're gonna have people employed twenty four seven to monitor that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's in their commercial interest to have all the redundancy they can afford. And have all the monitoring and forecasting of drives. I don't have any of that expertise, nor do I care to gain it. And I don't want to pay for it. So I'm willing to pay for, you know, what they, the product that they they give, which is, you know, the hot swap. They, they call it like a hot swap cloud storage, which is interesting. But, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively cheap compared to any other, you know, cloud storage. So I think with all of those combined... For nine dollars a month, I now have a very reliable um, Nextcloud instance with redundant storage that I don't have to worry about. Which is what's kind of my thing now. With like everything I'm doing now is just I don't want to worry about it because I barely have the time to do things I want to do. Yeah. Let alone things that I let alone things that I want. Like I want Nextcloud or I want to work on the access control system. I don't have time to do the things I actually want to do. So I want to minimize the time doing things I don't want to do. So are you in a place where you trust all of those people that you're now paying to deal with your data to not scrape your data for whatever? I'm poking the conspiracy, yeah. Aaron. But if you would, if you, if you would have asked me like three years ago, I would have fought, I would I would have argued with you all night on this and be like, of course not. I'm gonna do it all at home and I'm gonna do everything myself because I can't trust anybody. Because that's why I have mine. Whereas, you know, yeah, like 
but I also have a one terabyte Google Drive that's half full too. So so with the setup, you can you can um NextCloud NextCloud does support um server side file encryption. Yes. So all that stuff could just be encrypted and they just be binary blobs. And even even they, they kind of even are already even though I don't have that turned on. I looked at my my Wasabi bucket already and they're just a bunch of random objects yeah. from Nextcloud. Yeah. So I mean I think it's already like that. So Wasabi can't really scrape anything. There's really nothing on the virtual machine side to scrape from Amazon's side. It's uh it's really hard to just dig in and get to the raw files that are in the Nextcloud uh data instance. Yeah. But I'm sure somebody can figure it out. So a lot of my decisions lately have literally just been what can I do to save my own time? Which is a huge 180 turn from where I was a year ago. Yeah, when we started this podcast, it's a huge 180 turn. Um, it's it's crazy, crazy how kids change everything. Yes. I never thought it would change my perspectives on technology. That's probably the weirdest aspect of it. Um, because my, cause my last project update, which is kind of what, it's what inspired this whole conversation, which was um, when I, um, before I went to NomCon, um, I had been running on my phone, I've been running Lineage OS, which is an open source um, fork of, it used to be Cyanogen mod for those who are in the know for phone uh, modding. Um, I've been running Lineage OS for a, a year or two now on my OnePlus phone. And when I originally did it, I purposely did not flash any Google apps. So for a good two years, I was running my phone um, straight Lineage OS with zero Google apps. And I was just running F-Droid and with F-Droid apps for everything um, with the sole purpose of having as much of an open source phone as I can get and the most privacy respecting phone I can get. But with that, you run into a lot of issues with GPS becomes super slow because now you don't have all the super scary uh, privacy disrespecting Google GPS hacks where they scan all the Wi-Fi networks that you're in and they compare it against their database of Wi-Fi networks <laughs> that are, uh, you know, related to, to coordinates. And uh, so, so stuff like Lyft and Uber get really hard to use yeah. because you don't have that accurate positioning. And GPS, I, don't know if you ever, I don't know if you ever tried to use GPS by itself on your smartphone. It takes like a minute or more to obtain a lock. Yeah, it doesn't work Which is well. a long time. It doesn't work well at all. Yeah, it's awful. <laughs> Trying to use open street maps um, was awful. Um, that was a whole pain in itself to try and use. Um, just everything, everything was hard, and I made it hard on myself because I was trying to do it all as open source as possible. But uh, but when going to NomCon, I, you know, I was going to a, a, ta a, a state in an area I've never gone to before. I need navigation. I need, you know, Lyft and Uber to work. I don't want to have to fuss with it. Yeah. Because I have, I had like no time to plan things or figure things out. So I just need it to work. And I'm kind of, I'm kind of over caring about how open and respecting my phone is. I just need it to work. And I need it to save me time. Cause it got to the point where I was getting like slight anxiety, you know, issues with, Oh, I have to navigate somewhere. I hope my phone works. Yeah. And like, what if it doesn't work? And I didn't, in my mind, I have to kind of prepare for that. So I, I did not want to deal with any of that last weekend when I was at NomCon. So before I left, I wiped my phone, completely upgraded Lineage OS because I was like two versions behind. And I put like full stock Google apps. So I, I have all the apps that a Pixel phone has. Wow. And then I know. So I have all the things. Who are you? Which is, it, it's, it's weird for me to, to hear me say that out loud. But it's been so nice. I was going to say, but your phone works like so maps, good now, right? Ma <laughs> maps just fucking works. <laughs> I don't have to worry about it. You know, GPS just locks on. Lyft was no big deal. It's like all this stress just was, it was now gone from my life that I just, I had purposely put on myself, you know, as a, as a concession for a fully open source phone. Yeah, I can't remember the uh, distro that I was running when I was doing the fully open source phone, but it was terrible. Like, I didn't even have the swipe keyboard. 
Oh yeah, I didn't have Swipe oh, either. Oh my gosh, I couldn't <laughs> it, use it. I, I, I missed it so much. Swipe has been so nice to have. Back. It was like it, it was the period of my life where I talked on the phone the most because I just didn't want to text people, which is like my, my primary form of communication. So mm-hmm. that really says it all right there. <laughs> yeah, but well. I have no more project updates. I could rant about uh, open source phone software and how hard it makes your life, but how great it makes you feel because you're contributing back to the security clause and sticking it to the man all night. But I think that we should probably call it a night. Yeah. Yeah, we're about that, Mark. If you guys have things to add to the random episode that we just had, I, I, I was going to give ideas of like things that people could add to all this, maybe difficulties that you've had in uh, your open source experience. And like, you want to contribute back and you want to, um, you want to stay secure and you want to do all this, but also the man makes your concessions so tempting <laughs> by making your life so easy. Um, I'm curious to hear about him. Hit him us, hit us up on Twitter. I just personally realized how many messages we have missed on our Facebook account last week. Um, oh, I've been w- relying on my personal Facebook account to get them all. And apparently Facebook just like picks and chooses the ones to send you because <laughs> when I went to the page, there were so many people that I missed. So if we've, if you've been like waiting months for a response from us, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to check that more regularly now. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Cause I'm not on there anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, we would get them occasionally and I thought that's what all we were. No, we were getting a ton. And uh, <laughs> nice. yeah, now I feel like a jerk. I responded to everybody, but I still feel like a jerk. So this is the end of the podcast as well yep thanks guys thanks guys thanks guys thanks guys